Welcome to our sharing on the book of Exodus. I want to come into chapter 24 today, and we have the covenant ratified here. There's an awful lot in this. It doesn't appear to be so if you read it superficially. But I just want to say as, as an introduction that this is the most unique event that happened in human history before the incarnation of the Son of God. This was an occasion in which God manifested his glory and majesty in a way that had never been given to any other nation at any other time, as I've said before. For the first time in history, other people besides Moses, and we're going to hear that it's Aaron and his sons and the 70 elders are called into God's presence. Now, let me read this for you. I'm going to read it from the New Revised Standard Version. And he, that is God, said to Moses, Come up to the Lord, you and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and the seventy of the elders of Israel, and worship afar off. Wow. They're invited up the mountain and they're told to keep their distance. Why? Because the covenant is not yet ratified. Moses alone shall come near the Lord, because he's the mediator. But the others shall not come near, and the people shall not come near the mountain either. And that's a very important beginning to this very dramatic chapter. So notice that Aaron and his two sons who are going to inherit the priesthood through him, because the priesthood was given to the Aaronic family, not just to Aaron by himself. And so all his sons and grandsons and great-grandsons down the line, they would all inherit the priesthood. Not because they were holy, not because they were fit for it, but because that was how the, the priesthood was actually worked in, the, in those days. So going back to chapter 19, it was there that God actually proposed that he would make a covenant with this people and that the people actually agreed to go into a spiritual marriage with God forever. It's the forever bit we're going to be dealing with from here on in. What are the consequences of making a consecration? You don't make a consecration too quickly. Make sure you know what the consequences are. Now, because of this covenant that is going to be ratified here, and the people have already said yes, and they're going to say yes twice again, then they become God's unique people. Now, all people belong to God because he's the creator. He's the Lord. They become his unique people, and to them, he becomes Father, Lord, Savior, Redeemer, Husband, Friend, Guide, Teacher, absolutely everything. He becomes their everything. Now, but the very first thing that we're reminded of, again, at the beginning of chapter 24, is how do you get personal access to God? who happens to be the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and whose majesty is so terrifying that the, the people in chapter 19 just said to Moses, we couldn't take this. This is too awesome. This is too terrible. We, we couldn't take this. Let's put that down on a very ordinary level just for a moment. If I go to Rome, how do I get access to a personal meeting with the Pope? Or if I go to Britain or some other country that has royalty, how do I get personal access to the king or queen or whoever is in charge. So personal access is what we're talking about. That king or queen is king over the whole territory. If you go into the territory, you've gone into that person's kingdom. If I go into the Vatican, I've gone into the territory or kingdom where the Pope rules. But that doesn't guarantee me personal access to the man himself. And so this is what we're dealing with here. And if you remember, and to understand these chapters, we really do have to remember the early chapters in the book of Exodus. If you go back to chapter 3 of the book of Exodus, the, uh, when Moses had his encounter with God at the burning bush, he was told to keep his distance and to take his shoes off, because in those days, shoes were a sign that you were a member of the family. To take your shoes off meant that you were not in the family, that you were outside of the family. And as we discovered in the following chapter, Moses wasn't even circumcised. 
so he couldn't wear shoes. And you'll notice in the parable of the prodigal son in Luke 15, that when the son is restored to the father, he's then given back his shoes. That is his right to act as a son. So it's this personal access to an all holy God. And we have to learn both then and now that we don't have this access because of some goodness or worthiness that's in us. Because I'm going to illustrate that very clearly for you. And no good works of ours gives us access. Just as if I want a, a personal encounter with the Pope, it's not any good works or anything that I'm doing that'll get me that. There has to be some kind of influence that gets me there. There has to be something or someone who will actually do it. So when you come to the New Testament, we discover what true access to God is. And if you go to 1 Peter 3.18, he will tell you that our true access is in Christ and through Christ. Let's go to a very important text, which I can't do an enormous amount on simply because of lack of time. And it's Hebrews chapter 9. Let's see 1 Peter 3, 18 first. For Christ also died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. So it's his works. It's what he has done, not what we've done. And we're going to see here in chapter 24, it's the result of a covenant with God that gives these people access to God. So in Hebrews chapter 9, we have a long text, which I have to just ask you to read yourselves because it would take too long, from verses 11 to 14. Our access is through Christ. Let me just give you some of it. But when Christ appeared as the high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, because we're going to be talking about the tent of meeting, you see, and it's while it was God's idea and it was a pattern that was made in heaven, we're going to hear about that very clearly. At the same time, when Jesus allows himself to become a holocaust for us, uh, uh, to make reparation for the sins of the whole human race. His tent is not made with hands. It's not of this creation. The letter to the Hebrews says, he entered once and for all the holy place that is in God's actual presence in heaven. Taking not the blood of goats and calves, but his own blood, securing for us an eternal redemption. So it's a very important text and you should read on with it. In other words, access to God, our access is through Christ. I told you, you must have someone or something to actually give you access. The something is going to be the covenant. The someone is Jesus. And in this case, Moses mediating with God on behalf of the people. In verse four, the text actually distinguishes between the two things that Moses actually got. Now, there's going to be a bit of overlap in some of the texts that I'm doing, but the overlap is in the Bible. Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the ordinances. This is 24, 3. Notice all the words of the Lord. That's called the Deborim, or the Ten Words, or what we call the Ten Commandments. And the all the ordinances are what they call the Mishpatim, which I gave you in very, very brief form in chapters 21, 23, because we'll be covering it all again later. Moses came and he told the people, both the Ten Commandments, as we call it, and all the rest of the instructions, which are in the book of Exodus. And the people uh, answered with one voice and they said, all the words which the Lord has spoken, we will do. Now, put that into plain English. We will actually live the Ten Commandments. Not only that, but we will follow his instruction as to how to be a society that can live together in peace and harmony and justice, because that's what the ordinances were about. Okay, so that was the third time that the, the people actually said yes. But if you go back again to uh, Exodus chapter four, verse 12, 
God had said to Moses at the burning bush, after you have led the people out of Egypt, you are to worship God on this mountain. That is the place where the burning bush happened. And that's why the actual position of Mount Sinai has been debated all down the years. So since the, the issue about going into God's presence is that human beings must worship God, then what do you need? This is very important for the sequel. You need an altar. So verse four says, and Moses wrote down all the words of the Lord. And he rose early in the morning and he built an altar at the foot of the mountain. This is going to be extremely important because I have to jump from chapter 24 to chapter 32 to continue the events that actually happened at Sinai. And the chapters in between will be dealt with elsewhere. So you build an altar and it was to be at the foot of the mountain where the, the people could only come as far as the foot of the mountain. It was to have 12 pillars that means that this altar is sitting on a symbol of the people of God because the 12 pillars represent the 12 tribes of Israel. And he sent young men of the sons of Israel. Now those young men are probably the firstborn which belonged to God and had to be redeemed. So he sent young men of the sons of Israel who offered burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings of oxen to the Lord. Now, this is before the priesthood is actually established. And before the priesthood is actually established, Moses can do this because he is the leader. He is the mediator. After the priesthood is established, Moses wouldn't dream of doing this because it's the work of the priests and the Levites. Then we're told that Moses took half of the blood. The blood represents life. And by offering the animal, and taking its blood, it's, the statement is to God that we offer you our lives through this animal. And the blood of the animal was put into basins and half of it was thrown against the altar. Why was that? Because that was going to bind God to the covenant. Then he took the book of the covenant and read it in the hearing of the people. So notice a lot of work has been done and uh, they know the Ten Commandments, they know what they're committing themselves to, they know a lot of the instructions. In other words, you can't make this commitment without a lot of preparation. And he read it in the hearing of the people and they said for the third time, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do, we will be obedient. Oh dear. They say these words and they're going to struggle with them for the rest of their days. You can say words from the lips, but if your heart isn't in it and your will is not surrendering to God, you're going to have a huge struggle later. All that the Lord has spoken we will do, we will be obedient. And Moses took the blood and threw it against the people so it would be like using a hyssop stick and flinging it towards the people. So what is he doing? He's now binding the people to God's will. He first of all bound God to this people and now this people to God. And he said, Behold the blood of the covenant which the Lord has made according to these words. Now, there's a lot there. First of all, God wanted an altar, a very simple altar. As you know from chapter 19, he didn't want any dressed stone. He didn't want any fancy stuff. Just give me what you have on the earth, just ordinary stuff. But it, the real altar, you see, is us. Uh, in 1 Corinthians 12, uh, St. Paul describes us as the body of Christ. He's the head, we're the body. So we're the altar. And so the 12 standing stones actually was the people of God, offering themselves to God forever as his people. Now, if you go to the New Testament, there's a very, very simple incident that illustrates this perfectly, but on a much, much higher level. And that is the angel Gabriel came to a virgin in Nazareth, told her what God's will was for her. And she said, be it done unto me according to thy word. Total submission to the word of God. 
Now, these people have said in words three times, which is very solemn, uh, we will obey. We will obey God's will. We're going to see very quickly how long that's going to last. So this altar has to be built because in Exodus 4.12, the Lord said, you will worship God on this mountain. That's why you're coming. They can't be a priestly people unless they worship. They can't be a consecrated nation unless they worship God. They can't be a, a, a royal people unless they actually are transformed through this whole experience. So it was going to be massive transformation of this people. But if you go to 1 Corinthians 3.16, you will read, Know you not that you are the temple of the living God, and that the Spirit of God dwells in you. So this is the place where all this surrender has got to happen. It's got to happen in the interior. My soul, my will has got to actually agree to surrender to God. And if you think that's easy in all circumstances, just try it. So Moses, as I said, was able to do this simply because the priesthood was not yet organized. The people have now given their final, well, using the New Testament language, we would call final fiat, the final yes to God. Chapter 19, verse 8, chapter 24, verse 3, and chapter 24, verses 7 and 8. They've said it three times. So what they actually offered to God was holocausts. Now, a holocaust means that an animal is not only killed and the blood taken and put into basins uh, to be used, but that the animal is actually burnt completely. That means I hand myself over to you and a holocaust was usually done in atonement for sin and it points to the real holocaust that happened on calvary when jesus allowed himself to become the holocaust uh, to make reparation for the sins of all humanity from adam at one end to zachary at the other so that was the real holocaust these holocausts were uh, just pointing the way and the second thing they offered were communion sacrifices. Now, the Holocaust said, sorry for sin, reparation for sin. Therefore, I could have communion with God. Notice the order. Some people have missed out God's order today and they think they can go to communion and have communion with God without having repented of their sins without having changed their sinful ways. You're only adding sin to sin because it's uh, another sin to receive the Lord unworthily. And if you want to read about that, read 1 Corinthians 10 and 11. Okay, so the blood of the covenant was extremely important because that was the life of the animal. If you take the blood away, the animal dies. And so half was used to bind God to the people and half to bind the people to God. And that's actually very important. There was no going back once this happened. This was legal. And it was not only legal on earth, it was legal in heaven. And that was the uh, very important thing. So as you read in the Song of Songs, chapter two and verse 16, they could now say, my beloved is mine and I am his. It was a real marriage. And so to this day, many of that people use that expression in their marriage vows. My beloved is mine and I am his. But it originated in the covenant. So now that they've offered, they've said their yes to God three times, solemnly, publicly. Now that they have offered atonement for sin, now that they have offered communion sacrifices, then they have access to God. The door is open. That doesn't mean that they're saints. We're going to discover that rather quickly. And we discovered that ourselves rather quickly as well. We're no saints. Because they go down the correct route of repentance for sin, atonement for sin, and therefore you have access to the all holy God. Therefore, they can commune with God. And so what we find is that before the ratification of the covenant, Aaron and his two sons and the 70 elders 
could only come a certain distance up the mountain. But after it was ratified, they were actually invited into the actual presence of God. I'll deal with that in a minute, okay? They are a very special people now. And in Deuteronomy 28, verse 1, we read, If you will obey the Lord your God by diligently observing all his commandments that I am commanding you today, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the earth. You will be a very special people. And they would be the model for all other peoples as well. Uh, it would just be so very special. A legitimate question that can be asked, this is why I want to do this before we go on, is how could the blood of a sacrificial animal make such a difference in the relationship with God? Surely an animal doesn't have that power. And a very interesting answer to that question that I found somewhere in my research uh, says this, how could a couple of wads of paper change you from being poor to being rich. The banknotes themselves don't have any value. Their value is that they represent the gold that is in the central bank. And because they represent the gold in the uh, central bank, you have access to all kinds of goods and services. But there's no value in the actual piece of paper itself. So. The blood of these animals was worthless. It couldn't do what we are told it actually did do. So you're, aren't you going to say to me, but you're contradicting yourself? It would appear to be. It is that these were the banknotes in lieu of heaven's gold and heaven's bank, which was on Calvary. And it was all the sacrifices actually took their value from the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. It was his Holocaust that uh, redeemed everything past, present and future. It covered the whole of humanity from Adam to Zachary. And so uh, this was where the people were at in those days. And so God accepted this as a sign uh, pointing to the real value. So if they were transformed and changed, where did the grace come from? The answer is that God lives outside of time and space. Everything is now. Everything is present. And so they got the grace from Calvary, from Jesus, the true mediator. And when uh, Moses proclaimed the blood of the covenant, you've got to go down to the New Testament. I'm going to resist it because it would take too long uh, and realize that is the blood of Jesus that saves us. Uh, John is very clear about that in his first letter. It's the blood of Jesus that actually saves us. He's the Holocaust. And so these sacrifices only have value because of that one. That's actually very important. When you go to the uh, book of Revelation in chapter 7 and verse 14, John is talking about the Christian martyrs who have been given access to the actual presence of God in heaven. So what gave them access to the presence of this all holy, all pure, awesome God that frightened the people in the desert? And this is what we're told. These people washed their robes white in the blood of the Lamb. In other words, it was the precious blood of Jesus that saved them. It was because they allowed him to actually redeem them. Okay. I want to give you a little word of warning now. We're told at the very beginning of chapter 24 that Aaron and his two sons, Nadab and Abihu, he had other sons besides them, they were the two eldest, that they were invited uh, to have this very special uh, experience with God. So I'll read this particular text and then you'll understand the tragedy I'm going to tell you. 
This is in verse 9, chapter 24 from verse 9. Then Moses and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and the 70 elders of Israel went up. In other words, they went up into the actual presence of God after the covenant, because that gave them the access, after the sacrifices, okay? And they saw the God of Israel, and there was under his feet, as it were, a pavement of sapphire stone, like the very heaven in its clarity, okay? And he didn't lay a hand on the the chief men of the people of Israel. They beheld God, and they ate and they drank. Now that's one of the most extraordinary moments in the Old Testament. Before I go into that, I have to tell you something about Nadab and Abihu. They were given this absolutely extraordinary experience of God because of the covenant and because they were called to the priesthood and everything. But the call to the priesthood is not a guarantee of holiness. That is one of the things we just have to realize. And we have a very sad uh, story about Nadab and Abihu, which took place during their time in the wilderness. It's actually mentioned in the book of Numbers. Uh, it's given in detail in the book of Leviticus, uh, chapter 10 and verses 1 to 7, which I'm going to read for you. And it's, we just have to wake up and realize that just because a person is called to a great uh, vocation in God, it does not guarantee holiness and it does not guarantee that they will persevere. This is what Leviticus chapter 10 from verse 1 says. Now Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, each took his censer and put fire into it and laid incense on it and offered unholy fire before the Lord, such as had, he had not commanded them. And fire came forth from the presence of the Lord and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, This is what the Lord has said, I will show myself holy among those who are near me, and before all the people I shall be glorified. And Aaron kept his peace. And then the instructions were given uh, by Moses as to how to deal with the two bodies of these priests. Very sad, but it's reality. The very fact that we are called uh, to be the people of God, that we are called to holiness, that we are called to intimacy with God, doesn't guarantee that you actually get there. You have got to actually work on it and you've got to be faithful and you've got to actually do God's will. Now, you don't know the whole story by reading Leviticus uh, chapter 10. You'd have to also go into the book of Numbers and you'd realize that they were part of a rebellion against Moses and Aaron. They were a rebellion against the leadership that God had given to this people. So they both died sadly under God's judgment. So I want to give you another sad note that you may or may not have noticed if you've studied the Old Testament, and that is, this is only the book of Exodus. And you go on into the history books, and you go on into the books of the prophets, and the rest of the Old Testament, and never again do the priesthood and the elders of Israel ever have this experience again. They're not called into this intimacy again. And you might ask, why is that so? And that is that when you uh, read on in the starting with Judges and you go into Samuel and uh, Kings and all the rest of it, you see uh, that sin entered into the nation. And we're going to look deeply and closely at the fall of the people in chapter 32 because that explains the rest of the Old Testament hugely, hugely. And so the, the people actually fall back into paganism and false worship. And they even do that while they're still at Sinai. This is the awful thing we're going to have to deal with in chapter 32. And so they had to experience both chastisement and discipline from God in order to go on. But even though God eventually got them into the promised land, there was huge sin even among the leaders uh, in the book of Judges. And you go on into the books of Kings and you just say, oh, how does God put up with this? And if you think that's bad, then just read history today and you realize we're no different. 
here we are 2,000 years after uh, the greatest Holocaust that ever happened on this earth. And the forgiveness that came from the cross was enough not only for this world, for any world that could possibly exist. And yet look at the, the nations today, Christian nations turning away from Christ, turning away from the truth, turning away from love and going into their uh, paganism again even celebrating pagan rituals again. I mean, it's incredible. Now, what the priesthood there lost by the sinfulness of themselves and their people was actually restored at the Last Supper. Again, I can't go into it in detail because it would take far too long. But at the Last Supper, the elders, the new elders of the new Israel, they were the apostles, sat in the actual presence of God and it was before the great Holocaust on Calvary and they had communion with God before the event. The event was so great, it was so incredible that they actually had this privilege ahead of time. And from then on uh, they would go to the rest of the world and show the rest of the world how they could actually come into the actual presence of God. It's the same route again, repentance, atonement, the door is open, then you can enter through that door into intimacy with God. Then you can have communion with the Lamb and you can have union with God. It's a, a wonderful thing. Our communion with God is through Jesus and with Jesus and in Him. It's not outside of that. We don't have any access outside of him because uh, we are not people who are worthy uh, to come into the presence of God. We may have a high opinion of ourselves, but then reality can be different. So the covenant is made. We're still in chapter 24. The elders have had an absolutely extraordinary experience. And something that I'll just mention in passing is that they saw the God of Israel. Now, it's not actually possible to see God and live. So they're seeing something that told them that this was the presence. They also, you can't be that close to the presence of God without feeling it deeply. So this would be a, a massively deep experience, just as the three apostles on Mount Tabor, when they realized uh, the actual presence of the Father, they went down on their faces immediately. When in the chapter one of the book of Revelation, John meets Jesus in glory for the first time, he actually falls in a dead faint at his feet. It's not possible to come that close to God without having perceived something, but seeing God and living is not possible. We're going to deal with that in chapter 32 and three. They saw the God of Israel and there was under his feet as it were, a pavement of sapphire stone like the very heaven in its clarity. Now, if you go from here to the book of Revelation chapter 4, where you have a description of the throne of God, and you're told quite clearly that there was a pavement that appeared to be of glass. This is this clearness as of heaven. In other words, there was a sanctuary in front of God that no creature could pass, that the elders were outside of this, the 24 elders, and the priests were outside of this, and the saints were outside of this. Now, there were myriads of the saints actually described, but on this sea of glass, only one person was able to walk across it to the actual presence of God, and that was the Lion of Judah, who was the Lamb of God. He was the only one who could do it because he's divine as well as human. So the experience that these priests have is actually very deep and very profound. And so it makes the tragedy of Nadab and Abihu even greater, that they could fall after such an extraordinary experience of God. To eat and drink in the presence of anybody in the Bible means to have fellowship. So to eat and drink in the presence of God at the top of this mountain means that they are actually having deep fellowship with God. Whether they physically ate and physically drank, we don't know. Because 
I'm going to show you very, very clearly between chapters 32 and 34 that any time Moses goes up, he fasts for 40 days on, on the mountain. So when you're told that they ate and they drank, it's obviously you're referring to the communion sacrifices that they had so that they could have this deeper access with God. But the profundity of what they had here is extraordinary. And I want to underline it because when we come to the fall of Israel in chapter 32, Aaron's position is literally inexplicable because he had this experience of God. And so Aaron's two sons who had a tragic end, they had this experience of God. And it's a warning for us, uh, particularly uh, for people who have the tendency to want to go to special shrines and to have special experiences. Like I saw the sun dance in Medjugorje, many people would say. And my answer to that is, what did it do for you? Did it change you? Are you closer to God as a result of that? Or are you just simply boasting, I saw something unusual? And so we have to just be careful that the real communion with God is transformative. And we're going to see that Aaron and the two sons don't do well after this. We also see when you come to the Gospels that even though the three of the apostles had this very profound experience of God on Mount Tabor, they still behaved badly when it came to the passion of Jesus. So we just need to realize that there's no presumption of holiness in having the experience of God. Thank you for listening. Sloan August Bannock Day Live. Goodbye. God bless you. Ten years of sharing the peace of Christ. Shalom World, God's own channel.